I would now like to hand the floor to two members of the CINDEP board, Mr. Bulen Canol and Ms. Nadia Karayani, to share a few welcome remarks with you. Mr. Bulen. Thank you, Kirsten. My Lord, I feel like a new commissioner here. <laughs> Dear friends, dear guests, dear civil society representatives, on, on behalf of the Cyprus Island Wide NGO Development Platform, which is conveniently shortened <coughs> and uh, is called SINDEP, I would like to welcome you to the Global Civil Society Symposium. And those friends coming from other countries, I hope you will have a productive and enjoyable stay on this beloved, but not so fortunate Mediterranean island, Cyprus. SINDEP is formed as a significant example of what I call structures of cooperation between the two main communities on the island, who have been divided by intercommunal conflict. Due to this conflict, the people of Cyprus, mainly composing of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, have been living separately since the 60s, and this separation was further consolidated by incidents in 1974. The political problem has been on the agenda of the United Nations since for almost 50 years, and that is the longest lasting conflict remains to be solved by the UN group offices. The political leadership of both sides, unfortunately, have failed to solve the problem and make the island much more prosperous and potentially an example of bicommunalism, multiculturalism, and cooperation in the region. We just need to look around us and see how desperately this region is looking for such an example of cooperation and peaceful coexistence. So under these circumstances, we as people active in the civil society, we came together and decided to find ways to bring together the civil society. signed a memorandum of understanding and the foundation chapter and became the two founding members of SINDEP. SINDEP then was accepted as a member of CONCORD, the European NGO Confederation for Relief and Development, which is the umbrella platform of all national development platforms in Europe. So this constituted a significant example for the much needed structures of cooperation in Cyprus, and as civil society, we are leading the way and showing those interested parties that if there is a will, there is always a way. Of course, we have our difficulties, and like we found a way to become a member to Concord jointly, we are determined to find ways of sustaining this cooperation in our efforts in the field of development as well. Looking beyond Cyprus and helping those needy around the world by focusing on issues 
such as the one that constitutes the main theme of this conference, which is food security and nutrition. I would like to express my thanks and gratitude to all those who have spared the time to join us here for this important event. My special thanks should go to the EU Commission for sponsoring this event and to the SINDEP team under the leadership of Kerstin Witte, Witte, who has just addressed you, who worked day and night to make this event a worthwhile one to be part of. Thank you for coming and I hope you had a good time here. Thank you, Bulent. Distinguished guests, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all in Cyprus to this symposium. On behalf of the Cyprus Island-wide NGO development platform, I would like to express our thankfulness to the Cyprus EU Presidency, the European Commission, and our team for organizing this event. 12 years ago, 189 world leaders came together in a similar symposium at the United Nations Millennium Summit and agreed to tackle extreme poverty by the year 2015. The roadmap to this effort came in the form of the Millennium Development Goals, a set of concrete and specific goals for development to be achieved by 2015. The MDGs have been adopted by national governments, development stakeholders, and donors and have received global public support, thus becoming a compass for sustainable progress. However, the MDGs have not been entirely successful in capturing the vision of the Millennium Declaration for globalization to become a positive force for all the world's peoples for present and future generations. The United Nations, civil society, and other development stakeholders and academia have already embarked on a process in regards to these principles, form and sub substance for the post-2015 development framework. For this exact reason, it is really important to have this symposium now. It is really important to discuss today. Today is the time to influence the post-2015 framework. The United Nations High-Level Panel is submitting their report in May 2013, and thematic and country consultations are taking place now across the globe in an effort to develop a vision, shape, and content of the post-2015 framework. The symposium <coughs> will focus specifically on the food security, nutrition dimension, aiming to develop a human development-related goal cross-cutting issues such as governance, the role of private sector and sustainable agriculture will be discussed the following two days. Participants in this symposium will have the space to discuss, share ideas and experience with other key stakeholders such as decision makers and international institutions in order to formulate specific goals and recommendations on how food security can be anchored in the future development framework. Being an NGO volunteer members working in Cyprus with development related issues or organizing such an important conference was only a dream some years ago. In 2012, endless meetings brought us the first project for SINDEP and today we are hosting here more than 70 participants from 35 countries to shape the future of the world we want the world of a global partnership. I would like thus to thank you for devoting your time to travel from all over the world to be here and discuss, recommend, and formulate the Beyond 2015 strategy. I wish every success in our deliberations. Channel 
two is for French, channel one is English, but basically channel, channel two would be the relevant if you prefer to hear French. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Mrs. Tanya Cox. She's a senior advocacy advisor of Save the Children in Brussels, and she's chairing the European Task Force of the Beyond 2015 campaign. I want to use this opportunity to briefly introduce the Beyond 2015 campaign to you. Beyond 2015 is a global campaign aiming to influence the creation of a legitimate post-2015 development framework that succeeds the current UN Millennium Development Goals. Beyond 2015 is a diverse global civil society campaign bringing together over 450 organizations from over 80 countries. SINDEP is one of them, and so I believe are many of your organizations here. The campaign is built on a diverse and global base. It ranges from small community-based organizations to international NGOs, academics, and trade unions. The founding principle of the campaign is that it is a partnership between civil society organizations from the global north and the global south, bringing together groups from developing, emerging and developed economies. The campaign is supporting national civil society consultations in the Global South, along with GCAP, and engaging people living in poverty directly to include their voices, as well as supporting youth-led consultations. The campaign also has a quite active website, which I invite all of you to visit and to connect to. The campaign is really divided into national hubs, uh, sorry, into regional hubs. One of them being the European Task Force, which brings together over 200 European participating organizations in the Beyond 2015 campaign. It also consults closely with the full membership of Concord, the European Confederation of 1,400 development and humanitarian NGOs, working together to influence the development policy of the European Union since Concord is a participating organization of the Beyond 2015 campaign. The European Task Force is currently working on its position for a post-2015 framework, which will contribute to the Beyond 2015 global position in 2013. So now, without much further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Tanya Cox, Chair of the European Task Force of the Beyond 2015 campaign. in which everyone can realise their human rights, fulfil their potential, and live free from poverty. To achieve that, business as usual is not an option. And in this short sentence, I'm summing up what is perhaps our biggest challenge when we're trying to design our ideas to contribute to a post-2015 framework, as well as our biggest opportunity. Business as usual is not an option, because we've already proved it's not working. We may have decreased poverty quite a bit, we may have brought down child mortality, and we may have got a lot more kids back in school. But the fact remains that huge numbers of people are still living in extreme poverty. Disparities between the rich and the poor are increasing. And that's not just uh, disparities in income. And significant relative poverty exists in pretty much every country. What's more, we're not living sustainably. In fact, we're pushing the planetary boundaries beyond their limits in many different areas. And we're not solving some of the main problems. You could take many different examples, but given that we're here to talk about food security and nutrition, let's take an example from that. Let's look at the numbers. One billion people go to bed hungry at night. A further billion people lack um, sufficient micronutrients to lead a healthy life. And a further billion are overweight or obese. 
That's about 40% of the world population who are malnourished. Something has to be fundamentally wrong with the world food system and the way the world is functioning and evolving. What else is wrong for me to say that business as usual is not an option? Well, people don't feel empowered. They don't feel they have control over their, their lives. They generally they often don't have a sense of well-being. And the list could go on. But this is going to come back and hit us if we don't do something about it. Even if we only take one of the examples that I was just talking about, environmental sustainability, we've got to start taking this seriously. So why does this statement, business as, is not, as usual is not an option, present such a challenge? Rather than it being the starting point for discussions around post-2015. Well, generally speaking, when you're trying to change the way business is done, when you're challenging the status quo, you pretty soon come up against vested interests. You're labelled as an idealist NGO worker, a revolutionary or whatever. But you're not taken seriously. You're not considered to be a serious thinker or a serious actor. So one of our biggest challenges, to my mind, a civil society at least, is to get policymakers, decision makers, the ones pulling the strings, to think critically, to dare to challenge the status quo. <coughs> and to agree to make change in the interests of people. It's an odd thought, isn't it? The world's made up of seven billion people. But people just don't count. Or at least the vast majority of people don't count. So my first main point would be to urge everyone to think beyond the MDGs and this MDGs plus. We don't need more of the same. People don't want a future in which they play no role, in which they don't count, where they're just passive recipients of whatever the powerful and mighty dole out to them. Look what's happening in the Middle East. When we're thinking about post-2015, let's start by asking some tough questions about how the world operates and whether it's viable. Is it viable to use our natural resources at the rate we are today? Is it viable not to ask polluters to pay? Is it viable to allow the market to rule everything with no limits, even for the price of a human right like food? And what about this mantra of growth? OK, so now it has been softened. And more and more policymakers are talking about inclusive growth. But what does inclusive mean if you never consider the individual? Who are you including? If you don't make each person count, giving people equal opportunities to reach their maximum potential so that they contribute fully, as fully as possible, to society and to the economy, what does inclusive mean if you only measure growth using GDP. So let's think about adding some qualitative indicators to accompany the quantitative ones. We get a much better picture of how people are doing. So in the European Task Force of Beyond 2015, we're going to be putting people front and centre of our recommendations for a post-2015 framework. But we need to think very carefully about how to do this. We need to think very carefully about what needs to change so that people do have a meaningful life in which they can see their human rights realised. For us, the how you achieve what you want to achieve is as important as the what you want to achieve, given that business as usual is not an option. So here's the opportunity part of post-2015 agenda. We do have a chance to think differently. There is general consensus that the MDGs didn't solve all the problems, that there's unfinished business, but also that there's new business that we need to deal with. 
as well as business that wasn't tackled by the MDGs. So here I'm talking about things like governance, peace and security, human rights to quite a degree. If we're going to think differently, what does this mean? What does it mean in practice? Well, it means that the scope of the framework needs to be considered carefully. Both the geographic scope and the thematic scope. Is it an option to have a developing country only framework? For rich countries to tell poorer countries what they need to change? Even if we are consulting a bit more this time around. And even if we will contribute a bit to pay for that change? No. For the European Task Force, we want to see a global, universal framework with global goals, which apply to all countries. And all countries have to both contribute to the improvements in poorer countries, as well as improving the situation in their own countries, and contributing to improving the global outlook. So this, of course, implies common but differentiated responsibility. So that the goals can be contextualised to suit each uh, country. One size doesn't fit all, not anymore. Common but differentiated responsibility should apply to all the various actors who are involved. So they all take responsibility to act as well as for their actions. So this means, for us at least, that the future framework doesn't front apply to states only. While states may be responsible for making an awful lot of the change that will be required, those changes also need to address the role of other actors. Actors like the private sector, local authorities, and so on. The issue of responsibility is, for us, very important. And we're working on it pretty intensively. For us, this needs to underpin the framework. It needs to be there in every single aspect that we're going to be putting in the framework. Who is responsible for taking the action and making which change? And I think it's probably going to be one of the three key pillars which we're going to have as underpinning our proposals for a framework. So we'll have enablers to tackle the how we want to do things, we have responsibility for the who, and then of course you have accountability. But we're clearly going to distinguish between the ideas of responsibility and accountability. What else does thinking differently mean for us? Well, we want the framework to go beyond development. Especially if we want a universal framework which can apply to all countries. And which will address sustainability from all three angles. Economic, social and environmental. It means we need to look at the economy, trade, energy, agriculture, governance and power structures, peace and security, and the list goes on, if we really want to tackle poverty. It also means that the environment should be brought into this single post-2015 framework. But that's a challenge I won't dwell on today. We need to look at what is working and what's not. From the perspective of a human being, what are the obstacles to people thriving? Thinking differently means putting ordinary people first, marginalised people, the people we don't know and we probably never will. It means tackling discrimination and addressing inequality, giving everyone a fair chance. We can't afford to allow the vested interests of a few dictate our future and the future of our children. Business, as usual, is not an option. In our opinion, we need to be thinking in terms of all the transformative processes that will really make change, that will empower people. Whether that's addressing the obstacles to their having a decent livelihood or to contributing fully to society. So we need to be looking at the enablers that I mentioned just a moment ago. All the things that need to change for people to see their rights realised and to get out of this vicious cycle of poverty. Now, these enablers will come in different forms. So you could be looking at improving access to resources, access to market, just as you need to be ensuring policy coherence for development. 
Let's work this through a little bit. For example, what does access to resources mean? It involves things like accessing land. Okay, so what does that mean for the post-2015 framework in terms of the policy change needed for people? Well, it's things like the right to own land, to have assets, and for no one to take them away from you, unless, of course, you're given appropriate compensation. Which brings me back to the issue of policy coherence for development. I think that this could be crucial post-2015. PCD, put simply, means that no actor can do any harm to the development perspectives of another person. So, rich countries would need to assess the impact of their policies before implementation on poorer countries and their people. Transnational companies would need to ensure they do no harm to the communities in the countries they're investing in. Leave that to the people or to their environment. And international processes would need to be targeted too. What about the international trading system and its liberalised markets? What about financial speculation? They all have impacts on price, uh, food price volatility. Just to give an example from the theme we're here to talk about. Is it acceptable that food be a tradable commodity the way it is today? given the impacts of higher prices on poor people. I'd like to close with a few words about food and nutrition security. The world's food system is, a, is not sustainable, and it contributes to ecosystem degradation around the world. We've got enough food to feed the world's population, but one billion go hungry. Another billion are overweight or obese, like I said before, and have unhealthy, unbalanced diets. Worse still, one third of the food we produce is wasted. Now, this you could look at as an opportunity as well as a challenge. But what are the issues here? Clearly, we need to be questioning our consumption and production patterns. And clearly, this also affects the richer countries of the world, whose consumption patterns are not just increasing, but increasingly unhealthy and unsustainable. And what about agricultural production? Is it as simple as just expanding it so that we can get the food to everybody? What about the negative effects of expanding production, at least if we continue to produce as we are today? And here I'm referring, of course, to things like in the environmental consequences, greenhouse gas emissions and the like. And would the individuals who are currently going hungry actually benefit from that increased production? Probably not. Not if we look at who is doing the producing and what their motives are. Powerful businesses are loath to address poverty reduction and environmental preservation. But both of these are extremely important aspects of agriculture, especially smallholder, cyclical agriculture, rather than the massive monoagriculture. This conference is extremely timely to offer us a chance to think broadly about food and nutrition security, to look at all facets of food and nutrition security, Agriculture, the environment, energy, water, governance. In a world that is challenged by climate change, a growing population, global economic crisis, conflicts, governance structures which don't put people first, we need to be smarter, more efficient and fairer about how we produce, distribute and consume our food. As you may know, the UN is setting up a series of thematic consultations on post-2015, and one of these is going to be on food and nutrition security. It's led by the FAO and the WFP. Beyond 2015 is planning to submit its recommendations uh, in the form of a draft paper to this consultation, and we would welcome your feedback on our draft. It's in your packs. Perhaps we can take a moment to discuss it throughout the conference. This paper will feed into the high-level expert consultation, which is going to be hosted by Spain in March next year. But could I urge you
to start from the premise that business as usual is not an option. Be ambitious. No change will happen if we're not. Think laterally and joined up, because that's how the world operates today. And let's put people at the center of sustainable positive change. I wish you all a very interesting and productive conference. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome from me as well. Um, this is going to be, like Kirsten said, our panel on um, suicidal perspectives on food security and nutrition. Uh, we're going to have uh, a few words in the presentation and after we're going to have a discussion with uh, Lars Leth Gregersen uh, from uh, Concord, Denmark, uh, the PCD working group. We have uh, Jeske van Seltes from ECDPM, which is um, which is um, a think tank that specializes in what we're talking about here. And finally, we have Liana Mamusarian from World Vision uh, in Armenia. Uh, she's also representing, she's also a youth representative in uh, the UN Working Group for Beyond 2015. And we'll start with a presentation uh, from Laos. It's going to come up here and take over. Well, thank you. Uh, just to clarify, I'm from uh, the Danish National Platform of the Concord Europe Confederation, but I'm also a chair of the Pan-European Confederation's uh, work on policy coherence for development, and I work uh, very much with the food security issues related to uh, policy coherence for development. I'll try to give a, a brief uh, presentation uh, on the issue of global food security, and also uh, the concept of policy coherence for development, which is a quite technical term, so I'm not sure that everybody in the room uh, is familiar with the term, so I'll try to give some background information to stimulate this debate, but also uh, later on today when we are um, in the, in the breakup in the different groups. Well, first of all, uh, I think nobody would disagree that there is an urgent uh, hunger crisis going on in the world. There's massive food security uh, problems. One in seven person on the planet goes to bed hungry, and that's basically a disgrace uh, in the context of the uh, technical uh, advances we, that we have done, and the economic growth that we have experienced over the last 10 years. Still, one in every seven person on the planet goes to bed hungry. Uh, one third of the world's states are currently severely food insecure according to the UN so-called low income food deficient countries. Um, one third of all uh, food production uh, on the planet is wasted at the moment. Uh, in, in the richer parts of the world that is mainly because uh, people don't consume all the, the food that they buy or that are available in the supermarkets. And in developing countries, it's uh, mainly due to uh, bad storing facilities and uh, dysfunctional markets. Uh, basically, the picture is that we have a, a, a global food uh, security system that is broken, or a food system that's broken. Uh, on top of that, uh, over the last uh, five years, we have uh, experienced a massive increase in uh, price volatility on uh, basic uh, food commodities, and we've seen that both in uh, 2008 and 2011, uh, um, millions of people being pushed into uh, to hunger because of uh, steeping crisis in, in, uh, in food prices. Uh, but agriculture is also very much related to, uh, uh, to the whole sustainability discussion, because uh, around 30% uh, of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions globally uh, relates and stems to from uh, from food production. It's both uh, uh, the agricultural production, but it's also transports and the use of natural resources uh, that goes into to food production. Um, climate change is affecting the issue as well, uh, according to the uh, UN High Level Panel on or the Expert Panel on uh, on climate change in some developing countries. Climate change may cause uh, a 50 percent reduction in uh, uh, in the yields uh, of agricultural production in a lot of developing countries. 
and also there is an imbalance uh, between uh, in, in, in the use of resources uh, on a global level. For example, the EU uses uh, currently uh, 35 million hectares for its own food production outside Europe. That is basically feedstuff that is produced outside of Europe, but which is imported and goes into our uh, agricultural production. That's the, the 35 million hectares uh, outside Europe. Uh, this uh, amounts to a, uh, an area the size of Germany, so it's really a lot of uh, agricultural land uh, that we use indirectly for, for our uh, food production. Uh, I don't have the, the figure for the US, but I would imagine that it's, uh, it's about the same. Um, then, uh, in, in the Concord Confederation, and actually also the EU, uh, food uh, security policies are, are based on, uh, on the right to food. Uh, food is a basic human rights. Uh, Tanya touched. Uh, it's a basic human rights inherent in all people. Uh, Tanya touched upon that as well. Uh, and it has even been uh, there is an operational definition which was endorsed by uh, 185 states in Rome uh, about 15 years ago, uh, where uh, world leaders said that it's a right for every person on the planet to have regular, permanent, and unrestricted access to sufficient food which ensures a physical and mental individual and collective fulfilling and, digni uh, and dignified life uh, free of fear. And again, going back to the figure that I started with, that if one in, uh, in seven persons uh, on, on the planet uh, is affected by hunger, this is uh, clearly a breach of this uh, internationally recognized right. And uh, we need to think of that. That's a decision that all, uh, already has been taken. And of course, that needs to feed into to the discussions uh, on a post-2015 uh, framework. Here's a figure that I just want to illustrate that uh, why is uh, policy coherence, I'll come back to the concept, why is, is, is that important um, and why is the framework important? It's because we cannot solve uh, food security problems only by investing in agriculture or uh, by giving more aid to agriculture. Basically, uh, food security is very much a, a matter of political will. And this figure here uh, displays all uh, developing countries on the planet, put into a scale where you have uh, GDP per capita on the left, uh, basically how rich a country is, and then the percentage of its population uh, where, uh, of uh, kids under five that are staunching. And as you see, for example, I have highlighted some countries you will have Senegal that have a staunching rate of 15%, uh, and which has the same GDP per capita as India, but in India it's 35%, and I think nobody in this room would argue that India doesn't have the resources to help its population uh, to free them from, from hunger, but uh, they don't have the right policies in, in place. Another great example is uh, Equatorial Guinea. That's the fastest growing economy in the world over the last 10 years. Uh, mainly due to to uh, to uh, to uh, rising oil prices, they have a massive growth export of oil, but uh, they still have uh, forty percent of the kids under five years that are stunting. That's basically uh, irresponsible uh, policies from the government. Uh, but of course, in today's interdependent world, this is not only about national policies; it's about the whole global food system uh, and it uh, encompasses trade policies, uh, investment policies and so on. Uh, but this is basically to outline that what we're discussing here today when we discuss uh, food, uh, food security, I think it's very, very important to stress that this is basically about political action, coordinated action uh, uh, to combat hunger. It's not only about uh, uh, lack of investments. Then going to uh, PCD, that's Policy Coherence for Development, which is a, a long term, but it's very, very basically, it's about uh, saying that our policies, for example, in, uh, in, in the area of trade or how we in, invest, or even uh, we have a problem of speculation in, in, uh, in food commodities which, which affect uh, prices on, on agriculture, all these need to take into account uh, the development objective of eradicating hunger. Uh, and that is not something that I invented, it's actually a legal obligation uh, 
the, the EU uh, Lisbon Treaty in its Article 208, which defines the purpose of our development cooperation, says that all policies that are likely to affect developing countries must take into account development objectives. Uh, more and more uh, member states uh, of the European Union actually have a similar obligation in their national de de uh, development cooperation laws. We just, uh, in, in, in my country, Denmark, passed a law uh, one year ago, uh, which now uh, states the basic same principle, and a lot of, a lot of other states have the same. And then it's also agreed on the OECD Ministerial Council. So it's something that the main donor countries, the, the richest powers in the world, have already signed up to. The problem is how to translate this principle into action. Um, and of course, one of, uh, of the issues of, of, of uh, making this obligation a reality that will actually make a difference for the, the, the poorest people on the planet uh, will imply also to uh, have this principle insured in the new development, uh, global development framework of post-2015 uh, goals. Uh, I won't go into much technical details because there is a whole academic debate and institutional discussions going on uh, how to implement this, but I think for today what is important is that policy coherence for development is basically a way of thinking, it's a principle and it's an approach to development that says that development cannot be contained to a silo that is uh, giving aid from uh, donor countries to recipient countries, and then what goes on in all our, our other policies, uh, our trade policies, our diplomatic relations, uh, and so on, uh, is something different. Everything is interconnected, and we have a legal obligation and a moral obligation to implement this principle. Uh, in, in our everyday uh, political choices. So it's basically about choices, it's about political will. That's what's important today. Just to give an example of uh, why this is relevant, uh, I just highlighted one incoherence uh, related uh, to, uh, to agriculture and thereby also indirectly to, to food security policy. I think there is now an uh, international consensus that uh, what is really important if we want to improve uh, uh, food security for the most vulnerable people, we need to focus on all the smallholder farmers uh, that are already uh, living in, uh, in, 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 in developing countries. There are around uh, 500 million smallholders in the world. Most of them live in developing countries, but we also have that in Europe. Um, and these smallholders, they produce around 80% of the food consumed in Africa and Asia. So this is really our uh, a clear target group. And we need to, to, uh, to take account of that when we discuss food security. Now, for example, the Europe, uh, well, like traditionally the flagship uh, policy of the Euro uh, European uh, Union, its uh, first uh, real common uh, policy area is the uh, European agricultural policy, uh, common agricultural policy, also called the CAP, which is currently being revised. Uh, this, there's a lot of technical discussions again on how we do subsidies, how they are organized, and so on. Uh, but bottom line is that uh, it's well demonstrated that uh, our subsidies still uh, result in Europe exporting agricultural uh, products at a price that is below the production cost, which is basically not uh, an economically viable uh, uh, production, but which uh, compete with uh, local agricultural production, especially in developing countries, that's a problem, uh, because it's basically unfair competition. Um, we've shifted uh, to a system where we give direct financial support to our farmers, but in Burkina Faso, for example, the state doesn't have a budget that allows for it to basically subsidize its, uh, its, uh, its, its farmers, not at all at the same level as the European Union, and therefore this makes up an uh, uh, unfair uh, competition situation. And of course that is incoherent if we want to incentivize agricultural production in developing countries, which we know is the only sustainable solution to, to, to the world's uh, uh, hunger problems. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the, the European Union has a lot of difficulties basically recognizing developing countries' need for a policy space to pursue uh, national policies to build their agricultural sectors. Um, just to give one example, uh, in, uh, in, in 
2009, uh, there was a big milk market crisis here in, in Europe, and uh, where milk prices uh, dropped dramatically, and uh, milk farmers here in Europe uh, struggled to, to basically make ends meet. Then the Commission went into uh, massive intervention buying of, of uh, European uh, fresh milk uh, to support the farmers. And then uh, the year after reintroduced, or the same year reintroduced, uh, export refunds on, uh, on, uh, on milk powder because of this fresh milk had to go somewhere, it was made into milk powder. And then the year after we could see a 62% increase of uh, milk powder to Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a huge surge of European uh, milk powder coming into Africa. And uh, in Africa there's a lot of, of, of poor milk farmers. And we have, for example, one, one case study showing that in Cameroon, uh, you had um, uh, local milk farmers uh, where actually with the help of, of European uh, development aid, it, uh, they have been integrated in local value chains where they could uh, 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 sell their products to, to, to local dairies. Uh, but the price of imported milk halved in 2010 because of this uh, import surge and a lot of them uh, were basically squeezed out, squeezed out of their local uh, value chains and if you are a small uh, holder farm with only two or three cows and you can't sell your products for a year that's devastating for your business and basically for the European Union it's a uh, uh, loss of, 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 uh, of the development aid we spend already. So it's just to give one example, but that you could take uh, a lot of uh, examples from other policy areas um, that will make up a similar problem. Well, moving to uh, PCD in the post-2015 framework, um, I've just made four very basic uh, uh, headings that I think could inspire our, uh, our discussions. Um, First of all, the approach we have taken in the European uh, Task Force in 2015 is that we need global goals, meaning that there need to be uh, uh, goals that are binding for all countries and regions. So it's not only about what we have to do in developing countries, but also we need in, in the richer parts of the world to commit uh, uh, to, to, to certain goals that are enabling for, for development. Uh, of course, there needs to be a common but differentiated responsibility. It's not uh, the same uh, targeted indicators that would apply to, for example, Europe as would apply to, to Sub-Saharan Africa. But it's a very, very, very important principle when we speak about policy coherence for development that we have goals where all uh, actors in the international system commits on delivering uh, on, 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 on tangible targets. Another thing is that um, the current framework doesn't really address causality or the structural causes of poverty. Uh, Tenet touched upon that also in his speech early on. And PCD would be an instrument to say, well, if, if we look at what are the crucial uh, 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 enablers uh, that addresses the, the, the causal uh, structures, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in the context of, of hunger, that would be having a trade system that incentivizes investment and production in developing countries. Um, we need some kind of target indicators on uh, things that, that, that we know would be enabling to, to, uh, to, to create those kind of incentives. I'll come back to what that could be. Uh, then, of course, it's a, it's a matter of mutual accountability. We cannot expect developing countries to uh, deliver if we, don't, we, if we ourselves are not uh, willing to, to, to commit and to deliver on, uh, on, 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 on certain targets ourselves. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, policy commitment for development is very compatible with the rights-based approach to development, which is the approach of our uh, uh, confederation. To give an illustration, this uh, figure is from a, a report that Concord issued called uh, Spot on Policy Coherence for Development. Uh, and it's taken from the, the, the chapter which focuses on food security. Uh, it has uh, in the middle the human rights obligation that I touched upon uh, before uh, in the middle. And it has our obligation to uh, take account of that right in, in, in our policies. 
Uh, and then you, we've tried the mythology of the chapter, it's basically to try and map what are all the enabling or disenabling policies of the European Union that creates the basic conditions for realizing, for the opportunity of realizing, the possibility for realizing uh, the right to food for, for every person on the planet. Uh, and you could take a similar approach, basically, uh, with, uh, with uh, if you had a goal, for example, to say eradicate uh, uh, hunger in, in, in 2030, and say, okay, if we set up a goal like that, we need some targets and indicators on certain key policies where all countries have to deliver. For example, is there a, a proper market access for developing countries to export their uh, agricultural products to the European Union? Uh, do we have a, a proper regulation of uh, speculation in food commodities, for example, uh, and so on. Uh, so it's to give an idea of the logic of it. Um, and lastly, I'll just briefly touch upon, I think, I just want to underline, I think it's too early to start to discuss concrete goals where we are in the process right now. But say, okay, for the sake of, 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 of clarity, if we had a uh, uh, and you go, go who said, okay, we want to eradicate global hunger in 2013. Uh, that goal could be uh, composed of, of certain things. We need go, uh, targets and goals on how much aid we want to give. Uh, governments, for example, a lot of African governments already committed to, to use uh, a certain amount of their public spending on agriculture and they're not delivering. You could have uh, targets on that that they could, could be held uh, accountable to. And of course, you need to invest in research and uh, to have agreement on what kind of research enable us to touch upon that already, trade, price stability, etc. <coughs> These are all things that can be measured and that we have internationally recognized uh, uh, standards for and which also are in, in, in various bodies all, all, already monitored. So it's basically about gathering uh, those and, and putting them into the framework. And last of all, uh, we want to emphasize that it's the right to food that make up, uh, make up the basis uh, of our uh, approach to food security. And then I just took two uh, policies that are already adopted by the European Union, uh, which has almost everything that I, I said in it. We have a, a food security framework which recognizes um, the right to food, which focuses on sustainable agriculture already, based on scientific recommendations from the ISTAT, which is an international body uh, of researchers who gave recommendations on sustainable <coughs> agriculture. Uh, it has uh, nutrition also encompassed in, 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 uh, and uh, it focuses on, on local markets. Basically, the European Union already decided this framework. Now it's about how would that fit into uh, to, to Europe's input into the, to the negotiations on a new uh, global framework. Also, when we speak about uh, the sustainability part, we actually, in the ENVI Council, the Council of, uh, of uh, Environmental Ministers, have a very similar goal, uh, which was endorsed in, in March 2012, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, a lot of, 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 of global, because this is not only applies to, to, uh, to, to developing countries, but also in Europe, uh, uh, concrete goals on, uh, uh, on sustainable uh, Food security production. And then I would say, okay, if we already have decided these things, then the question is basically, how do we translate these into enablers that could fit into a, a new global development framework? Uh, we have a session on sustainable agriculture later on, so we can go more into depth on these, these programs. But uh, it's basically, I want to stress, it's, it's no need to reinvent the wheel. We have a lot of commitments already in, in this area and a lot of sensible policies that we just need to translate into to, to international action. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation where we are and where we need to go from here and also what we've done up, so, up to this point, which is the most inspiring part of all that. We're already on the way. Uh, let's move on now to Jeskevan Sitters. She is the Deputy Program Manager for Food Security in the Development Think Tank ECDPM from Netherlands. And uh, I'm passing on the floor. It's a different animal uh, uh, than, than Concord or the members of Concord in the sense that we call ourselves a think and do tank. So we're not uh, an NGO as such, but uh, the type of things we do is research uh, and facilitation work, uh, capacity building. Um, 
always in the area of uh, EU African relations. So our mandate is acting as a sort of an independent broker um, between the EU uh, and uh, uh, developing countries with a particular focus on, on Africa. We work on different aspects of uh, Africa-EU uh, relations with uh, aid, uh, development assistance being one of them, uh, but going a lot broader, also looking into uh, trade uh, issues, uh, security issues, um, and we have one uh, program that <coughs> focuses um, uh, primarily on food security, uh, and that's a program where, uh, amongst other things, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm involved in. Maybe a few words about uh, that program and, and, and what we do. Um, it mainly, um, there's, a, there's two sides of it. One side is uh, trying to work primarily with African partners actually to support uh, regional uh, initiatives to promote food security. Uh, and I think that's one of uh, the messages that I want to bring in in the sense that very often people are looking either at, at what's happening at national level or looking at also what we're doing here to some extent, uh, looking at, at the global uh, level, what's, what's in the grid in the UN, etc. Uh, but there's a lot of potential and also initiatives going on at the regional level. We have, in Europe, we have the, the EU, um, but also in Africa, uh, you have uh, ECOWAS in West Africa, COMESA, EGAD in East Africa. A lot of initiative and a lot of um, potential to address food security difficulties with groups of, of African countries. Uh, like uh, joint management of natural resources, for example, which are transboundary, you can't solve that in one problem. Um, there's um, the, the very surprising figures of how um, um, people trade, for example, not either in the country or trading with Europe, but, but levels of intra-regional trading between countries of um, also um, costs of transportation between countries uh, are very high, etc. So a lot of potential of uh, uh, increasing um, inter-regional trade, what, what, uh, what they're trying to do, and that's what ECDP, ECDPM works on, uh, with uh, the different regions, working with the different regional economic communities, but for example, also working with regional uh, farmers organizations that have uh, national uh, members uh, obviously, because there, what for one of the problems, for example, the farmers' organizations uh, struggle with is influencing uh, uh, policies and ensuring that it doesn't only uh, come to the benefit of the of the elites, but also comes comes to the benefit of of smallholders. And already at national level, uh, that's very difficult. At regional level, that's uh, that's even more difficult. So that's also one of the partners. Um, uh, we work with. That's one of the angles of our, our work. Um, and then secondly is looking uh, more into EU policies. Um, um, also the policy coherence uh, for development and how that affects uh, food security and I think uh, Laos has, has uh, explained that very well. One of the, the things uh, maybe useful to know, one of the areas that we work with in PCD is that it's very nice that the EU, and very important and valuable that the EU in the Lisbon Treaty uh, has committed to PCD and even in the European Consensus on Development that all member states have signed on to and which should guide development cooperation at the EU level but also development cooperation of Cyprus, of Denmark, of the Netherlands, where I'm from, uh, etc. There are also specifically policy coherence for development is an objective um, but what does that mean? How far do you go? And there's also policy coherence for maybe trade objectives, or there's, I mean, there's trade objectives to be made, and where, where does the balance uh, uh, lie? Um, so what we look into is uh, how do you uh, monitor uh, PCD? It's, it's nice to say that you do PCD, but actually um, what uh, targets do you commit to, and how then do you monitor if it's actually um, if it's actually done, and what's the impact on uh, uh, developing uh, developing countries? So that's 
that some of the dilemmas that are PC, it sounds very nice, uh, but, but how do you translate it into practice? And there's often no, I mean, there's no baseline. So, um, oh, so that makes it uh, uh, difficult, and that, that's an area that we, um, um, there, that we work on. One specific, maybe to, to, one, uh, to end, um, one of the things that uh, ECDM is involved in is the production of the European Report on Development. I don't know if you heard of it, but it's been produced now for uh, a few years, always on a, a specific theme. And the upcoming uh, report uh, that ECDM, by the way, works on with other institutes, including uh, uh, ODI, uh, or uh, Simon, uh, uh, works is also here, uh, and with the uh, organization in, in Germany. The, the theme of the next report um, is uh, post-2015. So there the idea is to um, um, feed into the EU position on uh, post-2015, uh, also by doing some case studies, looking in uh, um, uh, four specific uh, uh, countries. Um, and maybe drawing a bit from that work as, as sort of um, to structure the, the discussion maybe um, in the working groups um, after the, the lunch break is um, what the report will look at is the post ndd and the uh, 2015 framework in terms of where should it go in terms of objectives, what should be the objectives, and a second part what instruments do you use to uh, reach those objectives? Um, and obviously the current framework is very much only about, uh, about the objectives and not so much about the instruments. So that, I think that uh, second part is, uh, uh, is an addition and also something to take into account uh, to discuss in the afternoon. So what should those instruments uh, be? In terms of uh, the objectives, very briefly, it's already been said. Um, um, the the NDGs are currently quite uh, uh, narrow, or very much focused on social dimensions. So very much worth discussing. How can you look beyond that? Also to maybe uh, um, look at productive uh, capacities, um, uh, um, um, uh, climate change, all those type of things that are not. Uh, in the current NDGs, and also already said, uh, um, now it's very much focused on developing countries, but again, we have global goals that also commit um, uh, other countries uh, to things. In terms of instruments, there is aid, which, which is an important uh, uh, instrument, so there will be definitely things about that, but as already said, uh, there's also far more than aid, it is increasing in, in importance. Um, so how do we uh, move beyond um, uh, aid and promote policy coherence for development? Uh, not only that, also um, other types of financial flows that can promote uh, uh, development. Also in developing countries, I think domestic resource mobilization, for example, is, is, uh, uh, is key. Not only looking at what, uh, what aid can do, aid can, can leverage uh, maybe those type of of uh, financial flows. Um, also the private sector, which is one of the groups this, uh, this afternoon, how do we uh, leverage private sector funding for, uh, for development. Um, so, yeah, I think that's more than it. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, for the last uh, presentation, I'll then pass the questions uh, from you before we the break. It's uh, Jana Monsagian. Uh, she's the youth representative of the UN Working Group for the, for the Beyond 2015 Goals. And she's also a member of the humanitarian group uh, World Vision, which specializes in child and uh, mother uh, from Romania. Yeah. Let me express my greetings and say thank you for the possibility to be here and represent the voices of you here. And uh, let me quickly present myself. Uh, I am a, a member of the Advisory Council of World Vision in Armenia. Uh, so I am a member of UN Working Group, only youth representative. 
Um, I am uh, part of two networks also, uh, World Vision Youth Global Network and the World Youth Want Global Network. Uh, I have my own charity organization named Let's Create Smile, which focused on child, uh, especially child in need, in special need. Uh, my specialization is learn. So the world already began the process to define a development agenda for uh, the years to come after 2015. And today I'm going to speak about two very important issues. Firstly, uh, youth participation and then uh, food security and nutrition. I would like to begin by pointing out that I uh, was the only youth in New York and we were both uh, uh, in Brussels uh, participating in the meetings. Uh, in Brussels, I was uh, participating in the conference about MPGs and post-2015 organized by Concord. And uh, the, uh, the topics discussed there was social sector, uh, health, uh, including nutrition, and uh, environmental sector, and governance, lack of uh, accessibility to the information. In the final day, we have the possibility to ask some questions to representatives of uh, UN. My question was how youth can influence in decision-making process. The answer was not clear. <laughs> Uh, um, the mission to find possible uh, ways to youth participation uh, was uh, during the meeting, uh, the stakeholders meeting in New York uh, for a training youth engagement in development of uh, post-2015 agenda. I was there to tell the situation exi existing in the context of youth participation. Almost everywhere, uh, most uh, people just don't care about um, youth voices, what they think, what they see, and what in general they want uh, to have, what change they want to have. It's then, it's now it's, I think that it's time that the voices of youth must be heard and taken into account. Uh, by presenting the position collected from youth from different countries, I uh, ensure there and I ensure you too here that the voices uh, that the youth are ready to take actions to make your theories into the actions. And uh, after those events in New York and Brussels, I was continuing to learn about uh, the concerns of youth and to listen to their voices. And due to uh, Middle East and Eastern regional conferences held in Armenia and Turkey. I met youth from uh, Afghanistan, Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Cyprus, Georgia, Germany, Kosovo, Lebanon, Palestine, and Armenia. I also met a group of young people from youth uh, Impro empowerment program in the Bronx, US, and youth from Brazil. Uh, with them, I understood that our concerns are the same. Uh, uh, there, the issues that really affect youth are unemployment, violence, health, uh, related nutrition and food security, and uh, lack of education, lack of information. In Armenia, the main health concerns are child malnutrition and stunting, poor deaths of mothers and children, and access to maternal and child health services, especially in rural areas. Due to my charity initiative uh, being related to school for uh, children with special needs, I can say with my own example that uh, almost always mothers have to bring their children to those schools to keep the, the children to those schools because of lack of nutrition because uh, they don't have enough money to keep the child, to keep healthy the child. So this, this is the main problem. And so I was uh, alarmed from uh, the, one of the regions uh, in Armenia, named Gevar Kunik, that uh, uh, there was need of special diet for a child, and that this food was very expensive in our uh, country, and that is why the mother just uh, have, had not enough money to keep uh, that debt. According uh, to the demographic and health survey in 
30% of children under 5 in Armenia uh, suffer from stunting and up to 38% of children in rural areas have anemia as a result of poor nutrition and an insufficiently of micronutrients in their diet. Malnutrition and growth of child illness in Armenia is not only uh, caused by so social injustice and uh, economical problems, but also by the lack of public health awareness of many young mothers and caregivers in remote villages. <coughs> Uh, moreover, limited family budgets are often spent on food products of low quality with uh, questionable nutritional uh, value. Although the majority of women in Armenia receive medical assistance during pregnancy and uh, delivery, many of them apply for checkups later than required and attend a doctor irregularly. <laughs> These results of lack of awareness of, on safe motherhood uh, and reproductive health concepts. There are so low levels of exclusive uh, breastfeedings due to lack of knowledge. This indicates the real need for advocacy to prevent viol violations of international code of marketing of breast milk substitutes, as well as breastfeedings promotion and education at the community level on other related aspects such as healthy lifestyle, food safety, access to safe drinking water, safe motherhood, and essential newborn care. Uh, in Armenia, there was a Child Health Now program uh, that effectively addressed health lifestyle, healthy and uh, sick child care and nutrition, food safety. Since June 2009, World Vision Armenia intakes Safe Motherhood, Healthy Childhood, Happy Family program that aims uh, to educating people on healthy nutrition, empowering uh, caregivers and children to keep themselves healthy, to building uh, the capacity of community group to address and monitor local causes of illness, death and malnutrition, advocate for quality health service delivery and monitor uh, home-based care services. Partnership with national government and other stakeholders to ensure delivery of quality health and nutrition services to the community level. Within the project, num numerous capacity building uh, initiatives are planned at Alaverdi, uh, Kavar, and Yerevan uh, for community active members, uh, for community healthcare workers. So, uh, what should be done uh, to address the situation of nutrition and food security in the post MDGs framework? Uh, firstly, as a young uh, person, representing the voices of Armenia from my country and the voices of uh, Eastern Europe, I believe it's also essential to keep children and youth in the heart of the uh, post-2015 agenda. And children and youth, especially uh, most vulnerable, uh, must be included in the agenda, sitting, protests and beyond. Secondly, it's imperative that household food security and, speci uh, in, and specifically uh, maternal and child nutrition continue to be at the top of uh, the list of global development priorities. Government, international organizations, civil society and individuals must take joint actions to improve the well-being of women and children. From World Vision's experience, we know that community level intervention in the uh, first uh, thousand days are essential to ensuring that children can thrive. So what are my recommendations from the youth voices? I recommend that I recommend new development goals should be responsible to the voice of children and youth by facilitating participation of children and youth reflect the needs of the most vulnerable children in all contexts. Prioritize maternal and child nutrition, including stunting as a target. What can you do in this work? Workshops, written information about food security international standards among their networks. 
while fight for the proper exercise of these standards by local food factories. Learn from you, from your experience, how to dress in these cases. So, how, what is the world that you want? It's the world where uh, the voices of people, especially the voices of child, children and youth, can be heard. And uh, I'd like to finish by the question, uh, with the question, so why youth are so few participating in these kind of conferences? 